may make a start then. Um, first of all, welcome to what to, to my uh, prospective parents presentation. Bit of alteration for you there. I, I thought it was really really important, given the situation in which we find ourselves, given that uh, we're still in the, in the in the world of COVID nineteen. So I give you the chance to ask some questions on me later, but I get the chance to speak about the school and try and just talk to you about some monikers to give you some some food for thought, really, regarding as to where you will send your child next year. First of all, thank you so much for taking the time to join me. I'm mindful that um, it, it's a bit of time, so, so I'm grateful, so thank you. OK, in terms of some monikers, I probably shared this slide hundreds of times with parents, with pupils and staff about the vision for the school. When I took over here in January 2019, I, I was really clear that I wanted the school to be a place where the pupils are the most important people in the building. And I use the image on the screen right now of, of the Tour de France rider and the yellow jersey person being the most important person in the school. And when I speak about the school, I, I want the young people and your children to be the person that ultimately wins the race. And those people wearing the black jerseys, their job is to make sure that your child can be as successful as they can be. And that's really my vision for the school. I speak an awful lot in school about servant leadership, about leading from the bottom. And it, it, it really boils down to how we as adults in the school do all we can to make sure your children go where they need to go. And I don't see myself as the most important person in the organisation. In fact, most of the time, I'm probably the least important person. And my job is to make sure everyone else can do their job effectively and that your children can do as well as they can do. And that's really the, the vision for the school. In terms of our hopes for your children, when they come to our school, we really, really want to instill in them a sense of Catholic mission. So when they leave us at the end of year 11, they have the resilience and the courage to try and transform the world for the better. You know, we live in uncertain times and every single day on the news, we see stories that, that can make us upset and make us feel sad. Part of our job in school is to make sure pupils are socially responsible individuals and realise their job is to serve others when they leave us. And we talk about trying the best we can to build what I would call Catholics of character, people who can put the needs of others above themselves. We try and make sure that pupils at our school learn things in the appropriate time and the appropriate way. You know, we spent a lot of time over the past year and a half reviewing our curriculum plans so young people get the skills they need at end point to be as successful as they can be. And I also try and talk to the youngsters about placing value in everybody. You know, we, we sometimes live in a world which can be quite selfish and cynical. And the school that, that we are trying to build is one where people don't feel that way about people, where young people understand every single person is of equal value. And I think that's the most Catholic thing that we can do. In terms of um, performance, obviously school performance has improved in terms of results over the past two years. The class of 2020, who had a very, very difficult end to their school career because of COVID-19, um, we assigned them grades based on how they were doing in December and how they were doing in March. We've not shared those grades in a public forum at all this year, partly because I believe that the results from the class of 2020 belong to the children and do not belong to the school. And that's why they're in a big yellow box here and you will never see those results anywhere else after this meeting tonight. Because that was really, really important that the pupils enjoy some success and it wasn't about the school did well, it was more about the children did well. And that on results day, what I really shared with the newspapers was this, this statement which said this, Today we have shared the results with the St Monica's class of 2020. Over the course of the past five years, they've made us laugh, smile and cry at times. We've loved them and we will miss them. In this most unusual of years, we are delighted that, that the grades they have received will allow them to move on to the next stage of their education or employment. We hope that they take happy, happy memories with them and that they can make a difference in the world. We are sure they will. The results from last year were less important to me as than they were to the children. And we tried to avoid saying we've got the best results ever because it was a bit of a nonsense, really. We just tried to give the pupils the grades that they felt we felt they were capable of that meant they could go wherever they wanted to go next year and do as well as they could do. In terms of our improvement priorities, obviously the school was inspected in December. The school was taking out special measures, which, which is a real positive. And we continue to strive to be the very, very best that we can be in all the things that we can do. 
On the screen for you right now are our seven school improvement priorities and they have been the priorities that I kind of put in place in January 2019. Very little has changed in terms of what, where we need to go and what we need to keep working on. You know, we keep on working on pastoral systems and behaviour, improving the school curriculum, improving teaching, improving leadership of SEND, improving development of pupils and improving outcomes. And all those things will always, always be the case in any school you ever go to. We also tried this year to give some support to those pupils who returned after COVID-19 and, and the school shut down. What we have found is in the main, pupils just want to be back in school and want to be back learning. And that's worked really well for us. I talk a lot in the school about being on the bus. Um, as the pupils get older, their eyes begin to roll when they think of me as the cheesiest person they've ever, they've ever spoken to. But it's really about building a collective culture of we are all in this together. The best bit of my job is when you hear a pupil say to a teacher, I'm on the bus, sir. You know, and, and really, it's a simple way of getting the school culture to be positive and get the children to reflect on why they are here. And, and I would say in the main, touch wood, since September, almost all of our pupils really, really want to be here and we're really, really proud of them. So when you come to think about admissions for secondary school next year, um, you will have to do two things, really. You first of all got to fill in a local authority online admissions form. It's really, really important that you do that before October the 31st, because that is the deadline. In that LA form, you can pick almost any school you want to go to, but it's got to be filled in by October the 31st. If you want to send your child to my school, and I would love you to, we also ask you to fill in a separate admissions form that goes back to St Monica's and comes into us, okay? And on the screen right now is that supplementary form which you can see right now. It simply means that at the point of we get the admissions information and after Christmas, we can compare people who've put in a school form compared to a local authority form to make sure people have done the things that they need to do, okay? This is the form which we also need to share with us, the evidence of being a Catholic, be it baptism and so on and so forth. But if you fill this form in here and email it to h.collier at stmonicus.co.uk, by October 31st, you're also on our books as well. This form is available on the school website. If you go onto the website and click transit transition, it's going to be in there for you, okay? But as I was always say, it's really important that you fill in both forms. Number one, complete the local authority online form. If you don't do that, you won't be in their admissions module, okay? And you have until October 31st for that. Once you have done that and you wish to send your pupil to this school, which would be lovely, please also fill in the uh, supplementary admissions form, okay? In terms of my speech, that's really all I, I feel I need to say for you all tonight. The next bit of the meeting is really you having the chance to ask any questions that you may well have. You can see in your little toolbar, which I put on the screen, there's, there's a little hand up which you can signal. If you press the hand key, I will know you want to ask a question, then you can be unmuted and you can ask me a question, if that's okay. So if you want to ask a question, now is your chance. Please feel free to ask away. If it's a question I think may require a one-to-one -one answer, I might try and call you afterwards and also and so forth. But in the main, any question, I will try to answer it as best I can, as truthfully as possible. So it's over to you folks. Okay, Dan, would you like to unmute and ask away, please, if you could? Okay, I've got two questions really. Um, one, as you say, sort of thing, Ofsted have taken you out of special measures and you're now on requires improvement. In terms of your next stage, how are you aiming to get to the next level, which I think is good? Uh, I think if they inspected the school today, they'd say it was good. You know, I think what what's really hard to articulate sometimes is that schools are either improving or they are declining in my in my in my view and the strategies that we have put in place to move us out special measures will get us to good if the school were to be inspected tomorrow i would evaluate us as good in all four areas right now and i'm quite confident the evidence base exists for that and i, and I suppose from my perspective having having been in this situation a number of times in a number of different contexts i understand why offers really really important and it really is important 
but but for me the most important thing is continuing to improve the school day in day out and for me an officer judgment isn't isn't the end point you know if we got to good i'd be like well so what let's move on so i think this, the school is better now than it was when it was when it was inspected and i think if they if they came and saw us i think they would say that so for me it's those seven processes that showed you about improving the school if we keep doing those things and keep on fine tuning and making things more precise the school will keep on improving that answers your question dan okay yeah thanks very much and uh, one more kind of more general question is uh, i noticed that basically on the map in terms of social distancing at the moment and um, the space outside for the pupils is that limited because of the new college school area that's been segregated what do you mean by limited basically that outdoor space that i think you know basically you know i looked at other school areas and basically the playground it looks bigger in terms of you know the, the facilities for the kids to you know, at lunch times and breaks. Um, so well, would you I mean, say is it adequate or is it, you know, because of it, the... It is what it is, you know, unfortunately, I've not got £40 million pounds to build a new school. And I think what we'll probably say is, you know, when we looked at opening the school in terms of being COVID secure, we've got assigned spaces for all, all year groups, but we're not blessed with a big site, you know, and that, that's, that's not nothing to do with me. It's just the way it is. I'm more than happy that during the school day we follow the guidelines and we do the best that we can. I think I don't think it's um, schools are in a tough spot regarding things being COVID secure. You know, we simply follow the rules and there's very little we can do about the spaces that we've got. The year groups all have assigned spaces and they all stay in them. You know, that, that's and the children seem us seem happy enough. You know, we spent a lot of time revising routines and expectations to make sure these things are tight, but in terms of social distancing, we do the best we can. You know, what I will probably say is if <laughs> one of the things, schools have become the, the front line of COVID bad news management. And that's really hard for us because we're doing the very best we can. I'm happy that we have enough space on the site for the pupils. The pupils team happy. If you wanted to walk around at social time and you were allowed to, I'd gladly show you around. But I'm, I'm okay with it right now. The, the pupils seem happy enough. They seem to like coming to school and we're just doing the best we can. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, uh, that's enough. Thank you. Okay, anyone else with a hand up? Now is your chance. Okay, Kobe and Neil, would you like to unmute your microphone for me and ask away? Hi, yeah. Um, it was just a real quick one about boys English. I know the performance of boys hadn't been great historically. Um, and it's just more around that really, because we've got a boy. Um, just to see what the improvement levels have been like and what, what the plan is for the future. The plan for the future is to keep on doing what we've been doing. You know, I think what, when you hear generic statements like boys improvement in English, you know, my, 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 my default is to look at the boys in general. You know, if you've got 120, 115 boys in a cohort and you rank them top to bottom, you will always find that, that boys perform less well than girls anyway. I think over the last two years, the progress of, of boys has improved significantly and it will continue to do so. I think there's not a one size fits all sledgehammer approach to improving boys progress. I think it's actually the little things that you do all the time, the incentives, the quality of teaching, the quality of system, the provision, the focus on those young people, you know, and, and that takes time. Nationally speaking, boys and girls performances is different anyway. I'm more than happy that what we are putting in place for boys to engage them and push them is working and actually is. And really, I think not to not to reject the premise of your question, which I, which I may well do. If pupils come to school with the positive mindset and they engage in the things that we are doing for them and they push themselves in the way I push my staff, they will perform very, very well. And that's really what we're trying to do. And what you start to see is when you improve the culture and the focus and, and the tension around the building, gap in, uh, performance improves for all groups. And that's what's happening, you know. Last year, our boys' progress score was far higher than the previous year, and far higher than the previous year. And we just keep on going if that answers your question. Is that okay? Yeah, no, that's great. Happy with that, thank you. Not at all. Okay, Joshua Jones, go for it. Hi, yeah. I just wanted to ask what the typical day would be like from the view of a student, i.e. break times, how many lessons they would have, and just that kind of vibe. Okay. 
So let's assume that next September things are back to normal, which I can't guarantee, but you never know. OK, the school day starts half past eight with registration, uh, which is often and has an assembly in and some, and, and, and some formal worship. Uh, period one then starts at quarter to nine until quarter to ten. So you may have maths. Let's say you have maths period one. And you move to period two where you may have, uh, so let's say, a history. So period two is 9.45 to 10.45. 10.45 to 11.05 is break time. At 11 o'clock, year seven would then line up in their social space and be collected for period three by their teachers. So period three it was 11.05 to 12.05. You would then have, let's say, a period three, you have PE for an hour, and then you get changed. Then period four, you then go to science for an hour. Then you have lunchtime between 13.05 and 13.45. At 13.45, they line up again in, in their social space and they're escorted to period five, which let's say it's RE. So it's a five period day with a 15 minute break and a 35 minute lunch. That's great, thank you. Okay, no problems. Uh, Kobe and Neil, have you got another question? Or is, is it your old hand up? It's okay if it is. Oh, no, sorry about that. That's okay, it's all right. Okay, Jennifer Doherty, have you got a question for me, please? It has. Yeah, just uh, wanted to ask um, about the, the sets for different classes. How is that devised? How has it worked out if they're in set one, two and three? It might have changed since I was at school a while ago now. I did go to St Monica's and so did Jenny, but um, yeah, it's just to work out how, how the grades were, how the sets were worked out. Right, okay. Um, we would normally ability group pupils based on the Key Stage 2 stat score. So you and you, we group pupils across two different suites of subjects. So you're in the same class for science and maths, the same set based on your key stage two math score. And then in English, history, geography, MFL and RE, you're in the same group based on your English score. OK, in terms of PE, you, you are grouped as a, as a whole, as a half year group. And pupils who are, let's say a pupil is really strong in PE, but is less strong in maths they've been a more able PE class. Does that, that make sense to you? Because sometimes pupils are strong in certain areas, areas, of, areas of subjects, okay? You would then be placed in a mixability grouping for technology, art, and music and drama. Because again, we know that there are those pupils who excel in English and are less skilled in art. So actually the groupings are dependent on the disciplines of subjects. And then we would always review those groupings each half term to make sure pupils are in the right place. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 that's great. What Thank you. What I would always say is one of the real challenges that you always face as a, as a year six parent is whilst your child may be top of the class in primary school of a class of 35, you put them in a population of 230 and it's not so much that they're, they're any less able, it's the fact that the population is much stronger. You know, I think one of the things we, we discuss all the time is do we get rid of set names because people think I've got to be a set one child? And what I would always say to a parent is, We'll put a child in a class based on where we think they need to be to get the grades they are capable of. And we don't need to overly fixate on the number. You know, my, my, I've got a son who's in year eight at secondary school. You know, he's probably average ability in English and stronger in maths. I'd put him in any class in this school right now based on the teachers that we've got and the structures. And, and we've got to try and avoid focusing and worrying about where my child sits in the pecking order of, you know what I mean, of kids being yeah. And think about where my child sits in what's best for them so that they can do whatever they can do yeah. and i also say at the end of that if every child came to school and gave their best every single lesson every single day every single year they would achieve great things and whilst the settings help us give a framework for where they're going to go for a child the sky's the limit really and part of my job is also making sure they realise they could be the person that becomes the Prime Minister. I mean, for goodness sake, we need a new one, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. You're welcome, no problem at all. Uh, Joshua Jones, is, oh, Vicky, do you want to unmute your microphone, Vicky, for me, if you could, please? Hi, yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, just a question about, um, it says you're a specialist language school. Yeah. Um, and, and we just wanted to ask, could you just explain a little bit about that, what that means? Is it a subject that you prioritise, that you, you you put more reinforcement behind? Or, yeah, could you just tell us a little bit about what that means, please? Right. In the 1990s, the government introduced something called the Specialist Schools and Academies Trust, which was at each school of specialism, which it could be language years, drama, 
maths and computing. And that used to be what a school was known for, and it was a way for schools to attract additional funding. Now, the Specialist School Status Award ceased to exist in about 2009. But because schools still carry the designation, they still carry in their title. In reality, it means very, very little. You know, we've, we've got a really strong language department, but it doesn't mean we make all the children new languages. You know, so it, it's kind of an old title. It's kind of been phased out now. And we leave it on, the, and we are told to leave it on the school letterhead. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it's just, it, I was just wondering in case, we, you know, your child isn't very good at languages or, or they're into it, say, let's say, for example. I just wondered if there was more emphasis put on it. But no, that, that does answer. I mean, I mean, I would always say this. If a child struggles with something, it's our job to help them. If they find it hard, then we, we should support them as best we can. If we wouldn't, the government expects all three quarters of pupils in all schools to do a language in GCSE. I don't always think that's the best thing to do because you want the pupils to have a level of choice of what they enjoy. Right. So, um, you know, we, we try and have some level of curriculum freedom. But no, language is actually, the, the teachers here are brilliant in languages, but every child likes it and it shouldn't be a you do what we say kind of place, should it really? I don't yeah. think so anyway. Okay, that's great. Am I okay to ask another question? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, um, it was just to go back to about the question you mentioned about the periods. Can you explain why the dinner time is so short or, and so late in the day? Is there a reason for that? Uh, first of all, I don't think it's that late, but I can see why you would think that. You've got to try and back to the time. Yeah, with it, with it, with the day it. ends at three, is it three o'clock? Yeah, and they, and they start at half past eight. Yeah. I, just thought, I just thought personally it was a bit... Well, yeah, yeah no, I get that. I think you've got to try and it's really, really hard to manage an organisation when you've got 1150 children on quite a tight site. You know, and, and lunch times historically are not they they're, they're my least favourite time of the of the day because it we've got to try and get through it as efficiently as possible. You know, if you've got a lunchtime that lasts a little bit longer, whilst I understand that it's nice to sit and have a sandwich with your friends and, and I get all that, you know, it becomes hard to manage the longer it is. So, you know, if, in, in my previous school, this, in my previous school, it was 25 minutes and it worked really well because the, the, the school day becomes, becomes shorter. And what I often find is, you know, after lunch lessons, whilst they are good, are never as good as the before lunch lesson. And what we always try and do is, is keep the lunch times in the right, lunch times precise and secure, so most learning takes place before lunchtime. Now, not everyone agrees that, that's absolutely fine, but it's really a school management issue because what you actually want to do is, is maximise the learning time and minimise time for people not to do things they shouldn't be doing. You know, we, we, we played around with having a split lunch it doesn't work effectively on our site we've played around with having lunch after period after period three that's not worked either you know we've currently got a shorter we've got a longer day now of three periods because of to reduce movement that's working okay there's never an exact system if i'm honest with you and all you can try and do is look at the data and try and analyze where it fits best for whomever you know when year seven people start in september they do have an early lunch anyway they go 15 minutes early to, early to you get used to it Boy, it, I suppose I suppose it's school preference, if I'm honest with you. Yeah. And, and and every single year we get this question and, and I always give a really rubbish answer. But if, if you were to come and see how the school functioned during lunchtime, you'd probably realise why. Is that okay? It, it's just it was just a probably thought of the actual if the pupils themselves, you know, yeah. We all know that you get hungry and things like that and you just think can they concentrate as much if they're not having the dinner till four and a half hours after they start. It's it just seems because obviously I went to Monica's as well and dinner time was 12 o'clock and it was an hour and you got a chance to socialise with your friends as well as eat. But it just seems, yeah, I know what you've, you've answered the question, but it just well, seems... Well, to be honest with you, you know, at break time, the canteen will be open anyway. So, you know, sometimes what happens is some people buy their lunch at break time and then they're at lunchtime, you know. It, it, yeah. this, is, this is one of those situations where whilst I'm the head teacher of St Monica's, I'm not the head teacher of people who always agree with me. You know, yeah. and, and I think that, that's the tough thing. And, and I'm fine. I'm fine having the challenge. It's just, you know, I having managed quite a few organisations, the general feeling is always if lunch is longer than 40 minutes, 
you don't you want to make sure there's no what I call jelly time. Yeah. Okay. So, Thank you. Yeah. No, that's all. Thank do, you. Do I have any more questions? This is the bit where we see how long we can sit in silence together. OK, if there's no more questions, then what I would simply say is uh, thank you so much for your time tonight. This isn't a sales pitch, you know. What's really important is that as parents and as children, you choose the school that is the right school for you. And um, you've got to decide where you're going to send that much, that much precious thing that you own to be looked after for five years. You know, if, if, if there are any year six children on the call, I'll just say this to you. Please don't worry about your sats. You know, just be the very, very best that you can be. Do your very best this year. We would love to see you next year. OK, we really would. And our, our school is really, really moving in the right direction. But there's lots of great things happening. Please look at our website, look at our videos and stuff. But if you're a year six child, just do your very, very best. Don't worry about being told that you're behind. It's a nonsense. You know, just be yourself. And if you're a parent, which I'm sure most of you are, Pick the place that you think most aligns with what you, what you want education to be. OK, and that, that's really all I want to say. This isn't a sales pitch. OK, so thank you so much for your time. I'm really grateful. Thank you for your questions. Um, my Twitter handles there. If you've got any questions later, then by all means, please tweet me. I will reply. Um, but thanks for your time. Hopefully I'll see you all soon. OK, so thank you and take care. Goodbye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.